So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are back here. Professor Geoff Goodhill is with us uh, to respond or to answer the question you might have uh, regarding his uh, presentation this morning. So uh, we have a few questions for the moment, but I hope people will continue asking while uh, he's responding. So let's try to start inviting the, the first person in the list, Shabika Rastogi. So let me invite him on the screen. I don't know if he's not there or she is not there because uh, uh, it might take some time. I think it takes some time. Eh? She, okay, I think it takes some time. Yeah, it takes a moment. Okay, she's there. Yeah. Thank you. So, so hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Thanks for the nice. So thanks for the nice talk. So my question was, uh, how the axon, as you told in the in your uh, uh, presentation, that axon guidance is affected by the range by the it's sensitive to the range of concentrations. It's uh, since uh, it is there only for a narrow range of concentrations. So my question is, how is it affected uh, by the change in concentration? For example, concentrations do change due to uh, thermal fluctuations or due to stochastic noise uh, in uh, the brain. So how will it change uh, the axon guidance? So will it affect it in any way or how is it robust? Right. So those are two slightly different scales. Um, so um, before I talked about the, the model which pre predicts the narrow range of sensitivity to gradients, we talked about uh, modeling the thermal fluctuations and the um, receptor binding noise. And um, so that's, that, that, you know, that gives you uncertainty in your estimate of concentration of um, a few percent for typical parameters. Um, but um, the, in terms of the, uh, concentration range for effective guidance, that's about two orders of magnitude. So, so that's a very different um, sort of range. And I mean, intuitively what's going on there is just that um, um, at very low concentrations, you don't have enough receptors bound to get a reliable signal. And at high concentrations, essentially all the receptors are bound and you can't get a reliable signal. And um, yeah, so you have about a hundred fold to play with in, in there. So it's robust to the range of the fluctuations in the concentrations, right? Well, um, as I say, we I presented those calculations, which tells you exactly how um, those fluctuations affect the sensitivity. So, so those calculations um, tell you the uh, fractional uncertainty in your estimate of a concentration. Okay. And so if you compare that between the two sides of the growth cone, that gives you um, a sort of a sense of what the minimum gradient is to be robustly detected. But as I say, that's a slightly different issue from the um, the complete range of concentrations. So does this range of concentration which you talked about for the reliable axon guidance, so does it change over the course of development or does it remain the same? Right, so this, um, I mean, I didn't really emphasize this in the talk, but that, I mean, there's nothing in that model which actually has anything to do with axon guidance. It's just a model of a small sensing device. And so actually that applies to any sensing device, be it a growth cone or um, uh, anything that's using a spatial sensing mechanism. And so from that point of view, no, those constraints don't change over development. Now, what might change over development is the receptors that are expressed on the growth cone. So okay. um, because that, that curve shifts with the dissociation constant. So it's roughly centered on the dissociation okay. constant, for the receptor ligand okay. interaction. So if you express different um, you know, receptors and respond to different ligands, then you know they have then you'll have a different range of or, or so if you have the same ligand but um you 
you have a receptor which has a very different dissociation constant, then you could use that as a way of extending the concentration range if you down regulated one set of receptors and not regulated to another. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Erika. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, we have the, we have uh, Tom Burns, which is around, so he has several questions. So I will invite him also to to be on the screen. Yeah, it's not immediate. It takes some time. And I was there. Hey. Hi, Tom. Um, I want to ask uh, the same question. The sound is not very good. So I'll just ask my own questions if it's okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, two, two questions I had was, uh, does zipperfish display social behaviors at different levels of complexity? And if so, do wild type zipperfish, uh, are they better at maybe reproducing the more complex behaviors than the knockout uh, or, or the fragile X uh, fish? Right, so we've mostly focused just on the very early stages of social behavior and we we're following some nice work by Elena Driosti, who has um, um, developed this 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 uh, U maze assay uh, where fish sort of swim between two arms of a, a maze on one side they can see a fellow fish and on the other side uh, they can't they can't see a fish and um, the the the, the uh, data I showed in the talk was, you know, when they're looking at another another fish, how they're responding to those movements. But there's also part of that experiment is also how much time they spend on that side of the chamber compared to the other side of the chamber um, where there isn't a fish. And the, in fact, the the fragile X fish um, actually um, sort of counterintuitively, they actually spend more time on the side where there's another fish, because you might think um, that, you know, sort of intuitively you might think they'd be less social um, but in fact they seem to be more interested in other fish they just are worse at responding to them than wild type fish so um in terms of so, so we haven't looked at adult, adult fish and of course adult fish do um, have shoaling behavior and mating behavior and so on um but um we haven't um we haven't looked at that so i can't i can't say um whether there be differences in it yeah, yeah. And actually, it's interesting what you just mentioned. I wonder if that would even be a compensatory kind of mechanism, like staying near the other fish, uh, because they're maybe not good at the social interactions, so they try to increase their chances or something uh, of having a good Could be, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and another question I had was actually a bit related to the question you just had before. Um, so I think in the model you showed for the growth cone, it was a 1D model. Was that correct? Uh, like the growth uh, one day right so so there are a few different models there so so the okay. um i mean the the, the the bayesian model yeah 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 so, um, so that was uh that was one d yeah so we also extended it to two dimensions right okay and uh, three dimensions is that did you extend that as well or? um no no just okay. the three dimensions i mean uh -huh. the the I mean, there was so that I mean, there was nothing particularly interesting that happened um, in two dimensions compared to one dimension. I mean, it certainly didn't help us um, understand the experimental data we had. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like a good fit. So um, I wasn't sure that it would necessarily improve. Yeah, but just curious to know if uh, there was any difference. Um, yeah, that, so so we had a paper in neural computation uh, where we mm -hmm. looked at the two D, the two D case. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and actually, have, did you have you also looked uh, at sort of interactions between different um, ligands and different concentration so, gradients competing? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, I mean, that's a, a question of great interest in the biology because uh, we know there's often um, gradients that collaborate. And so what we considered was the um, issue of, say, they were collaborating in an optimal way, right? Um, and um, so again, that's in that same paper where we looked at the 2D case, um, that same neural computation paper, we um, looked at what would be the base optimal strategy to combine information from um, different 
um, different ligands. And of course, that depends on their concentrations, right? Because mm -hmm. the, um, you know, for very high concentrations and very low concentrations, they're not giving very reliable signals. Um, so I you know, can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but, but I guess you've got to have sort of a perfect storm of these concentration gradients to get like the perfect or fastest mm -hmm. growth. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, well, I mean, one conclusion from that work was that um, having multiple gradients doesn't, you know, doesn't solve this problem okay. of, um, you know, there being quite a narrow range of concentration. Okay, okay. Um, just one final question then. Um, what hypotheses do you intend to be testing in the whole brain zebrafish imaging during sleep or 24 hour recordings? Right, so there are some very nice um, computational models of sleep. And um, but the biological substrates of those are are less clear. So things like the uh, the you know the two process model, and um, so by looking at whole brain activity, the hope is that we'll be able to um, you know, really test where in the brain are the substrates of some of these models. And I guess because you've also got the model, the SIVA is it called or C uh, S yeah. sil uh, silver. silver silver yeah. silver yeah. So you can look at sober vote and, and spontaneous activity across the whole brain and mm -hmm. see those different systems. Okay, cool. Sure. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. Hi, Jeffrey. Uh, Maurizio de Pidella from the Basque Center of Applied Mathematics in Spain. Hi. Um, a couple of questions. So uh, might sound a little bit mind provoking. So is there any glia in the zebrafish uh, brain? And uh, if so, what do we know about uh, this role in the axogenesis and neurogenesis of these functional circuits? Right, so there are certainly glia there. And I can't tell you very much about um, their role in uh, neural development. That's sort of not something we've looked at. But if you're interested in glia, I would definitely refer you to a recent paper from Misha Irons um, at Janelia Farm. So A H R E N S, and um, they found that glia play a very important role in uh, certain kinds of larval zebrafish behaviour. So uh, this is a, a story that was recently published in Cell. Um, but with regard to their role in neural development, um, I mean, so, so I mean that's just not a thing we've, we've looked at. So I'm afraid I don't have much to say about that. So. Then uh, switching to some other things. So, like you showed this interesting video about this clustering of activity in the testum, mm -hmm. right? So, <clears throat> is this uh, uh, clustering somehow occurring in spontaneous uh, conditions, or is it modulated by the actual movement of the zebrafish in some way, some cognitive task, or? Some kind. Do we know about this modulation or the, the way this modulation could occur? Right. So the tectum is is upstream of this, and so um, we so in our preparation, the, the fish is completely embedded in agro. Um, people like Herman Sombre in Paris have looked at uh, tail-free preparation, and they had a nice paper in Neuron in 2015 where they looked at um, uh, spontaneous um, uh, assemblers in the tectum. So they were just looking at one age, but um, they had this tail-free preparation and they found that um, it was often the case that um, activity in the tectum uh, was correlated with tail movement. So the idea is that spontaneous, so spontaneous um, activity in the tectum then drives the tail movement. And it doesn't happen all the time, but, but some of the time. So what about your Zebrinator model? Um, you show these very interesting uh, simulations. Um, I didn't quite got if the model is 2D or 3D, in which you study essentially the perturbation of turbulence in the in the environment of the zebra fish. It's a recent work that you're saying it's, it's in progress. Yes. Right now. Yes. So, could you say a little bit about, about this model? If it's like in in actual 3D environment, or you're studying? Yeah, yeah, in absolutely. So, so it is in a 3D environment. So, so. So I'll, I'll tell you the complete workflow. So we have all these movies, um, which are of the zebrafish moving around. And um, so, so those movies are in 2D, but obviously we know the 3D shape of the fish. And so 
Um, we take the the you know the we we do image processing on the movies to extract the you know the the backbone of the fish, and then we have a three D model of the fish, and we make the three D model behave in the way um, you know that the actual fish is behaving, and then we calculate the forces involved in that using this computational fluid dynamic software. So it is it is a three D model. Obviously, I was just showing a two D um, a two D uh, sort of cut through that simulation, but we know what's going on in three dimensions. So, yeah. And out of these simulations, did you find out there is a potential feedback from the perturbation of the environment on the actual sensory system of the, of the zebra fish? So that essentially the, the fish is, is moving in a sort of uh, optimized fashion or according to what is its own uh, effect on the local environment. Right. So I, mean, I might be a little bit uh, far fetched, but just ask. Yeah. I mean, Clearly, the, the fish is getting feedback um, from the fluid flow because um, it has a lateral line system, which is which is measuring fluid flow. Um, I guess we can't say anything from our simulations about um, to what extent it's you know, you know it's directly sensing that and using that to control its um, control its motion. I mean, the questions we're more focused on is the efficiency of different bout types because there's a there's a, the order of a dozen different types of uh, movement it uses at this age and so we're interested in um, how it selects those different kinds of movements um, and whether the efficiency of those movements is helping to determine which ones it selects at different ages because the relative efficiencies of different types of movement um, change with age as the fish grows right and I, I, the last, the last question in you know, this regard, and my last question in general is: Do you actually observe uh, like uh, what we call the FAPs, so fixed action patterns, uh, perhaps in the zebrafish? Like, do they, do they, there is an involvement about these FAPs in the zebrafish uh, across different stages of development, or, or not? Sorry, could you just say it again? I'm saying, do we observe any kind of FAPs, so fixed action patterns? And the level of neural correlates in the zebra fish, and if so, is there like a, a development? Hi, Martin. Hello. Uh, and is there like a development in uh, uh, of these FAPs as the as the fish grows? So, I mean, the, the fish movement essentially consists of these discrete bouts. So it's about you know lasts one or two hundred milliseconds, and consists of a series of movements of the. Of the, of the tail and um then at this age you know those are separated by by periods when the fish is not moving um and as i said there's about you know people classified maybe a dozen i mean it also depends how, how finely you slice them but um roughly people speaking people agree there's about a dozen different types of of, of bouts and um so far we haven't um i mean we've, we've this is a, a level of detail which we didn't get to in this um, current biology paper that's just about to, to come out. But um, so far, we haven't seen um, fundamental changes in those um, stereotype movements. Um, so at the moment, at least over the period we're looking at, um, they're, they're fixed. I mean, if you look, at, other people have looked over, um, um, you know, there's fish going all the way up to adults. And I mean, the movements become a lot smoother. I mean, adults ever fish, you know, they don't move in these discrete bouts. They, um, you know, they swim continuously. Well, so I mean, the, the, the question here is not really to see perhaps uh, the change in the movement, rather the change in the frequency of the usage of these movements. Um, yeah, so that's not something, um, I mean, we, we have the data, we're working on it. Um, uh, yeah, so to, to look at whether there's changes in the, the frequency of bout selection, you know, the selection of different bouts, um, whether that changes with development, that's something we're working on at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I cannot. I can. I can hear. 
Job uh, Gutel, but I cannot hear the moderator of the session. Ah, so, yeah, it was my fault. Sorry, I had my mic off. Sorry, Martin. Yeah, I you can start okay. now. Sorry. So, uh, so hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Martin Zapotocki from, from Prague. Uh, I, I, I work actually on modeling of axon growth and uh, axon mechanics. So mm -hmm. I know some of your work that you were discussing in the first part uh, of the talk. Uh, really, very, 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 very nice work also to read about. Uh, I was looking forward to meeting you in Melbourne, but uh, uh, well, in two years, right? Uh, in two years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, Today, you uh, you talked about your work uh, showing the fundamental limitations on growth cone uh, navigation uh, arising from biochemical signaling. And uh, I'd like to ask a question about another possible source, source of limitations, which is the mechanics of the axon. Mm, right? So right, even right. if a reliable signal is generated in the growth cone, uh, then the, the cytoskeleton in growth cone has to rearrange. Uh, mm. Attraction force has to be generated, which depends on having good enough adhesion to the substrate or to the exocellular matrix. There may be uh, mechanical tension in the axon shaft behind the growth cone, which would basically make the axon continue to go straight. Okay, So uh, there are these mechanical factors, and I'm wondering if uh, there are situations, if you are aware of some situations, either in vivo or in vitro, in culture where the mechanics could be a limitation. For example, in, in a strong gradient, uh, maybe there is some limitation on the possible radius of curvature or, you know, the, I mean, reacting to a weak gradient, probably the cytoskeleton has enough time uh, really to rearrange. But reacting to strong gradients, uh, maybe, for example, if, if you're moving in an environment where you cannot get a really good grip and have difficulty generating traction force, one could imagine that there would be inefficient turning, even if there is a very, very strong uh, signal. Right. So that's a very interesting set of questions. Um, I mean, I think um, in terms of uh, uh, constraints on its ability to make a, uh, a sharp turn. So there are certainly cases in vivo where axons do make quite, quite sharp, sharp turns and they can, you know, they, they can slow down to do that. Um, but in terms of the um, exerting uh, traction forces, then I think that's a really interesting area. It's not one that we've worked on, but uh, people like Christian Franza at, at Cambridge have been very interested in that, and you probably probably know that work. Um, and you know, there's some evidence there may be uh, gradients of stiffness in the developing brain, and um, you know, axons prefer to grow on stiffer substrates than. Um, less stiff substrates, as I as I recall, um, and I think that's you know that's a really um, underexplored area, and so um, you know I think that's a all I can say is I think that's a very interesting set of set of questions, but not not one that we really um, have much to say about. But, but you would say it's an interesting thing to to maybe work on. Definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah. And, and just curious, do you know of any situations? Have you seen any situations where, for example, the growth cone would be slipping uh, and uh, you know not doing a smooth motion, but basically uh, right? So, so there's a um, behavior uh, during uh, so there's there's a um, there is definitely some some work. I mean, I'm not sure about slipping, but there's basically uh, there's definitely some very interesting work on. Um, um, the interaction of the growth cone with substrates of different um, stiffnesses, and how that how that varies with stiffness. Um, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but maybe if you send me an email, I'd be happy to um, get back to you with um, some some papers about that. Sure, sure, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, let me see if we have more questions. And not for the moment, but I, I have a few very naive questions I want to ask you also. Uh, I remember you showed us a video with the axon growing. I think it was only a one realization of, it was a bit, so I guess it was the only realization. But I can imagine that if you have many realizations, you would be able, with uh, some machine learning tool, for instance, to predict the direction of the growth of the axon. Would that be possible or not? Or is too too stochastic the process? I mean, uh, the process is pretty stochastic. I mean, it, what I, another problem is so so one of the movies I showed was it just growing across the bottom of the dish with no 
you know, particular yes. guidance cues. And um, that, you know, um, I think in the talk I said that dish was glass. I think it's actually a plastic dish. And there's, you know, a certain amount of texture on the bottom of the dish, which is just from the manufacturing. And the, you know, related to what we were just talking about, the, the growth cone is, is sensitive to variations in the substrate. And so um, I think, you know, th that would be a, so the substrate is, is perturbing the growth cones movement. So from that point of view, I think it'd be very hard to predict exactly what it's going to do next because there's environmental cues which are very hard to control, which um, are helping to determine, um, you know, the direction it grows in at each, at each, at each moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Then when, when you show the, the silver fish, you say that the, when uh, during development they become more uh, more precise in hunting or, or in, would that be related to the necessity of of the of the fish for more food since they are developing they, they probably need more food do they improve because of of the yeah, so I, I should have, yeah sorry i should have, i should have said that in the talk that um so up to five days post fertilization they're they're basically living off their yolk sac um but then that starts to get depleted and they need to catch their own prey and so um, if you don't, so they can survive till about seven or eight um, days if you don't mm -hmm. feed them. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, starting from five, they're starting to catch their own prey. Okay. Well, just my last question, because Thomas is also entering now. Uh, then when you when you talk about the learning rule and these patterns of spontaneous emission, you show that with, with learning rule, you have some patterns that start to appear from, from this uh, quite a stochastic environment. That reminds me the, the idea of the, the polycolonization of uh, Eugenie Sikiewicz, where he also had some spontaneous activity and, and uh, uh, adding some learning rules, you start to see some pattern that remains there. It's a kind of, of learning uh, plasticity rule. Would that be more or less similar to that? Uh, yeah, our work is certainly related to that. And um, I can't remember the all the details, but I, I do know that we, we cite that work in our in, mm -hmm. in, in our paper so um our, so so it's certainly related um i mean we were very focused on trying to explain some of the quantitatively explain some of the properties of our experimental data from the sure. from the, from the fish. okay thank you thomas your turn hi uh, yeah uh, sorry for taking a completely different directions one once again but i re i'm really interested in the spin microscope technique to, to have a whole brain recording i mean that sounds absolutely fascinating and I, I had two questions about that so one of, of them is uh, what are the limitations on the kind of dyes you can use I mean could you do this with voltage sensitive dyes but then also what limits actually the the update rate which seemed for the whole brain uh, it's good but one second uh, or one hertz isn't yeah, good. yeah okay so so there's you know there's a bunch of trade-offs here so so the basic technology is that you use a you know a one photon or two photon laser you turn it into a sheet and you send it through the brain perpendicular to the um to the scope now you can i mean you can you can do that at a frequency of of the order of 100 hertz right but the thing is um you know for one plane right. but you also want to capture the whole the whole brain and so this sort of one volume per second time scale comes from the fact that you're scanning the sheet through um, maybe you know the order of um, 50, 50 planes. Um, so you're only spending like 20 milliseconds on each on each plane. Um, Does that have to do with how long you need to excite or does it have to do with that you can't move the mirrors any faster? Uh, well, so there's a there's a combination of in fact you, you mean what's limiting it to 100, 100 hertz. Um, I mean, it certainly involves both of the things you mentioned. I mean, obviously, the less time you spend on each plane, the dimmer the signal is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, they, you do get to the level of having some, um, well, it, you know, there's different kinds of technologies you can use. I mean, what seems to be the way to do it at the moment, the way we use is use an electronically tunable lens because you need to ver you need to be moving the focus um, right. so that it's matching where the sheet is. And the early systems, um, some early systems had... Um, um, did that mechanically, but the, you know the objective of the microscope is pretty heavy, so you get all this bouncing. But now people tend to use this uh, electrically tunable lens, so you, so it, there's, there isn't a moving part up there. Um, 
With regard to the sensors, then we're using GCAMP um, 6S, which um, you know, is nuclear targeted and produces these very nice, really well-defined um, uh, neurons. Uh, a disadvantage of that is it's got a very long decay time of the order of um, several seconds. Mm -hmm. And um, so even if you could image a lot faster, the, you know, it wouldn't necessarily help you very much with a sensor Not with those kind of connections. Yeah. No. Now, so, so voltage sensitive dyes are certainly a very you know exciting area. Um, there's some some really you know fundamental problems one has to overcome with those. So one of which is that they're obviously um, present in the, in the membrane, right? Because that's where the voltage is changing, and so that's a very small volume. So unlike so we're measuring calcium in the nucleus, um, mm. and but if you're just looking at the volume of the membrane, you don't have many fluorophore molecules there. Also, oh, it gets um, very dim. Yeah, it's very dim. Um, right. Then also they, they seem to bleach at the moment they seem to bleach very quickly. Oh yeah. And of course, and of course, if you want to, you know, actually use them, um, I mean, assuming they're they're sensitive to millisecond changes, then you have to be imaging at a sort of millisecond time scale in order to see that. So you've really got this, you know, this all these things just working all in the wrong direction, right? You need to right. be uh, you've got very few fluorophores and fluorophores and you need to be capturing an image in the order of a millisecond. So, I mean, I think, you know, eventually the technology will get there, but I think, um, uh, and people are starting to do it, but it's certainly not a routine tool that many labs are using at the moment. And, and so the, the frequency would go up if you just limit yourself to presumably less sheets, yeah? Or yes, yeah, so, 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 so it's all a trade-off, right? You can, you can yeah. get um, like, um, you know, lots of neurons at slow temporal uh, speed or um, uh, a few neurons uh, much more rapidly. Right, right, I get you. Yeah, very exciting. I, I, I like this stuff. It makes for very, very good movies as well, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't hear you. I think you're still muted. Yeah, I muted the, the, the micro just in case the other surprise. Now you hear me. Well, uh, we you responded all the questions. I think you were quite clear. Um, you now, if you want, we can wait probably a few minutes. Just if someone else uh, wants to ask another question, we, we have still some time. But if not, uh, we can end the session, end the session whenever, whenever you, you like. Uh I mean, I'm happy to wait another couple of minutes just to see if anybody else. Okay. Shows up. Can you comment in the meantime? Can you comment in this in the, where, where you found this uh, um, these clusters of of activity in the? Can you can you comment on that because it it looked like you have some cluster. How was more or less the synchronization between them? Were they synchronizing time or what kind of dynamic? Right. So that's a great question. And um, so one of the problems with that that movie is that it speeded up 15 times oh. and, and so there's lots of things that you see there which are not really there um, um, because everything's being compressed in, in in time and so we actually so, so you know for a typical uh tech we might find say five or six assemblies right and they're spatially they're spatially localized and so we were very interested if there was any sort of temporal sequence so on average um you might get an assembly event um, you know, every, of the order of one minute. Um, mm. um, but so, so, you know, that's already a sign that maybe they, you wouldn't expect to see much dependency between different assemblies. Um, I mean, obviously they, they're, they're occurring sort of randomly. So sometimes they occur closer together than that, but we did do, we did do an analysis to check whether there's any, um, um, systematic ordering in which the assemblies occur. And um, alas, the answer was now. I was really hoping there'd be something more interesting, but um, alas, they, they they really seem to be occurring randomly. Okay, good. Thank you for that response. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think we don't have more questions, so let sure. me thank you, Jeff. It was it was great to have you on board, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for the very interesting and nice talk. Thanks again for inviting me. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.